Well, thank you very much, Susie. I appreciate it. And I do apologize if you hear any noise in the background. I have both of my uh, grandkids here today, even though they've been <sighs> told to be really quiet. Fingers crossed. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking about senior pets and why senior pets need dental care too. As soon as I figure out my slideshow here, we're going to be rocking and rolling. There we go. So one of my favorite quotes is by a friend of mine, um, Dr. Brooke Nemec, and um, he's a veterinary dentist out of San Diego. And one of my and, and he said this one day, and I looked at him. I said, "You're right. It's it's true." Age is not a disease. It's just a consequence of not dying. And this was in relationship to the fact that we hear all the time in veterinary dentistry that, oh, you know, my doctor told me that um, I can't have my dog's teeth cleaned because he's too old and or he can't have this procedure done because he's too old. And this is when I always get a little bit um, kind of try to figure that out because what's happening is we're gonna talk about the fact that dental disease is an infection. And when a patient has an infection, you wanna treat it instead of just ignoring it and hoping it goes away. Um, and, and dental disease is so important to the quality of life of that pet. I kind of compare it sometimes to what would you do if, if your you know, 98 year old grandmother fell and broke her hip, would you just kind of say, well, sorry, grandma, we can't fix it. Um, we want to make sure we're taking care of these patients even into their senior years. Come on. Here we go. So we know that um, in this reference I have here, about 80% of dogs and cats over two years of age have some degree of periodontal disease. Now, having talked with Dr. Nemec and other colleagues of mine in veterinary dentistry, we actually feel it's probably higher than 80%, probably closer to 85 to 90% of patients over two years of age have some degree of disease. And that can just be gingivitis. Gingivitis is stage one periodontal disease. So it can be very mild, but we wanna make sure that we are actually treating these patients instead of just ignoring that. Because there's a survey done, and this is a little bit older, but it was from 2013 that showed that um, only 14% of dogs receive dental care at a veterinary practice. So even if we were at that 80% range of patients that had dental disease, we have missed the boat on about 66% of those patients because we're not recommending their care that they need to have at that, you know, to, to prevent that disease. And, den and dental disease is truly preventable. We prevent it in ourselves all the time. So we need to make sure we're tracking to our clients and how to um, make sure they understand how important it is that we prevent dental disease. And how do we do that? We do that by every patient, every time. No matter what that patient presents for, um, we should be taking a look at their oral cavity. And that means that we're gonna be going ahead and looking at seeing what's happening, um, you know, that what's happening, whether they present for a laceration or vaccines or whatever the case might be, the more we look at the mouth, the more the clients are going to understand that, hey, this must be pretty important. They're looking and talking about the teeth every time I see this patient or every time they see my pet. So they must really realize that this is something we need to be, be looking at and paying attention to. Now we know within veterinary medicine that there are roadblocks. And we know this, I mean, we probably, depending on where you went to school, whether it was, was a veterinary school or veterinary technician programs, they don't have a lot of training on dentistry in those programs. It's getting better, um, but it's still not where I think it should be. Not when 80% of our patients have this disease. And we know we're not getting that training, so we don't understand about dentistry. And we're kind of afraid to talk about it because we don't understand it as well as we should. So this is why I appreciate you guys all being here today so you can get a better understanding of what dental disease is and kind of um, how important it is that we treat it. And we know that we don't always put enough emphasis on the importance of oral care. Now, I know back when I went to tech school eons ago, I got like an hour of dentistry. Um, in fact, my instructor actually asked if I wanted to teach that section because she knew what I was doing um, in research at that point. And I'm like, no, this, no, this is your job. Um, so we don't put that emphasis. But like I said, it is getting better. There are some tech programs that have it as a full semester. Um, the college um, 
veterinary colleges, the AVMA has made it now a core requirement. Um, so more and more vet uh, students are getting the dentistry education they need to have. But it's important that we really recognize the fact that periodontal disease is an infectious disease that's caused by a plaque and the resulting inflammatory response. So there's a couple terms in there that are really important for me and, and hope that I can resonate with you. And that is that it's an infectious disease. That oral disease we see, that periodontal disease is an infection, okay? Um, if I was to take the gingiva off of a standard poodle or a, a Labrador retriever, and I had kind of all the free gingiva off of their mouth, it would be about the size of the palm of my hand. Now, can you imagine a pet owner not demanding treatment when it's the size of the palm of my hand? If that was on their shoulder, their hip, their backside, belly, anywhere else, that owner would be demanding treatment. But because it's underneath the lips, we tend not to talk about it. And the other thing that's so important in this definition is it's caused by plaque. Now, a lot of times when we're looking at a dog's mouth or a cat's mouth in the exam room, we're really you know, a lot of people concentrate on how much calculus is there, how much tartar is present. And we're gonna talk about the fact that tartar really doesn't cause any issues. It just gives more surface area for more plaque to grow. So it's the plaque that I'm most concerned about because that's where all the bacteria and all the other things are in. Now, dogs and cats are experts at hiding pain. They know that if, you know, instinctually that if they show pain, they could be the first one kind of cut from the herd, so to speak. So they're really good at hiding that. They don't want to let our, their owners know they're painful. However, I can't tell you how many times I'd have a senior patient and we'd clean that mouth up. And when I'd call that patient or call that client back in a few days to do a checkup, they're like, oh my God, he's a puppy again. I didn't know he was hurting this bad. So we know that this dental pain can be painful. Now, as I said, plaque, the definition here is a soft gelatinous matrix consisting of bacteria and bacterial byproducts. So what is in that plaque is so important. We have salivary glycoproteins in there. We have the bacteria that is there. Um, we have lipids, cellular debris, and as well as, as extracellular polysaccharides. And what's so important to know is that those glycoproteins and those polysa polysaccharides are what can really take... Um, cause that plaque to adhere to the tooth, okay? So plaque actually is going to start forming as a biofilm and plaque will start to form within 20 minutes of brushing your teeth or within 20 minutes of a cleaning, we start laying down that first layer of biofilm, also known as a pellicle. Now, as that pellicle is there and it's not disrupted, it's going to continue to lay down these, um, all these different bacteria and glycoproteins and things like that. Now, if it's not removed every 48 hours or so, it's going to start turning into calculus and, or tartar. Now we have to understand too that antimicrobials are not effective alone. We can't just use pulse therapy of antibiotics to treat plaque, it's not gonna work, okay? We have to make sure that we are removing it on a regular basis. And that's why brushing or some kind of home care product that the, the client uses is so important. Because if we can remove that biofilm, we can remove that plaque, we are going to go ahead and, and prevent this chronic inflammation that we have or that inappropriate host response. Okay, and it can also prevent systemic infections on the host. So we know that that biofilm is going to start you know, growing on the crowns of the tooth, but it also grows up subgingivally underneath the gum line. And on the crown, it's an aerobic gram-positive bacteria. But as it starts to move up underneath the gum line, there's less bacteria or less oxygen available. And it starts to, the type of bacteria actually changes or delineates. And we get into having facultative bacteria that eh, may or may not need the oxygen. And then as it continues to, to move up underneath the gum line and there's no oxygen available, the type of bacteria um, convert to being anaerobic, all right? And now these anaerobic bacteria are also gram negative. And when we look at gram negative bacteria, they are gonna be much more pathological. And we start seeing anaerobic gram negative bacteria and spirochetes. Now these black pigmenting ana, um, anaerobic bacteria are the ones that really start causing most of the issues when it comes to 
to the uh, periodontal disease. They're going to produce endotoxins. Um, they're going to also prevent or, or produce something called volatile sulfur compounds, also known as thiols. And that's what gives that bad breath, that malodor the dog has, that kind of almost rotten egg smell. That is the, the thiols that are being produced by those bacteria. They also um, will start, excuse me, producing protolytic enzymes. Um, the neutrophils kind of come in. The neutrophils are trying to save the day. They're putting on their little white hats, trying to save the day. However, because there's so much going on, these neutrophils become activated neutrophils and they no longer really do what they're supposed to do. In fact, they contribute to the disease mechanism and they start producing inflammatory cytokines. And all of this basically means we have destruction of the periodontium. And when we look at this, the destruction starts really at the first layer of the epithelial tissues. And then as that bacteria continues to grow up underneath the gum line, it increases the depth of our sulcus from being a normal sulcus depth in a dog of one to three millimeters in a cat about a millimeter, we start seeing periodontal pockets where we start having pathology present. And what's also happening at this time is we're destroying the periodontal ligament and the alveolar bone is being destroyed. So we don't have that mechanism of the periodontium that's holding the tooth into its socket, into its place. Well, we know there's consequences when we look at um, periodontal disease and we can have local consequences. We can have oral nasal fistulas. We can have the pathological fractures. That little toy breed dog jumps off the couch, bumps his chin on the floor and breaks his jaw. All right, we could have periocular damage. This can happen sometimes in, um, in con conjunction with like a, a abscess. Um, a lot of times we'll see periocular problems along with brachycephalic breeds. We can have osteomyelitis or bone infection. And of course we then get tooth loss. But what we really need to think about too is this mouth, this horrible mouth you're seeing on the screen here is actually creating a problem systemically. And we start seeing reactions to the kidney, to the liver, and to the heart. So we know that there's a systemic link to periodontal disease in people, okay? But we also know that there's some veterinary, um, veterinary data that shows there's a systemic link to, in, in veterinary medicine also. So in people, we know that the, the microorganisms and periodontal disease are um, contribute to inflammatory bowel disease, as well as cardiovascular disease, um, we see those in the plaques in our arteries. And even in arthrosclerosis risk communities, we start seeing coronary um, artery calcifications. Um, we see it associated with renal insufficiencies. It's contributing to stroke and TIAs, as well as thickening of the wall of the, the carotid artery. So we start to see this in humans and we know this is actually correlated into veterinary medicine. A lot of times when I'm talking to clients about dentistry in animals, I'm gonna compare it to what happens in humans. And that helps it relate a little bit more to what they're seeing. Now there is some studies done. There hasn't been a lot done, um, but there's more and more out there. Um, Dr. Linda DeBose in 1996 um, looked at the association of periodontal disease with histological changes in multiple organs. This was done here at, at Kansas State University. Um, so they were seeing a link between periodontal disease and lesions on organs. In 2005, Pal uh, Pavlika um, did a, a study that showed that there was a systemic effects um, with wounds in the oral cavity. In 2006, we saw that there were uh, echocardiographic alterations in periodontal disease or with dogs with periodontal disease. And then also in 2005, we saw mitral valve endocarditis after a dental cleaning in dogs. So this is something that a lot of times humans will have, will develop a, a, a endocarditis because of periodontal disease. So we see this in dogs as well. Dr. Rollins from Colorado State University was tracking systemic parameters, whether pre and post treatment for periodontal disease. And this is really no shocker that the, with the increasing severity of periodontal disease, there was an increased concentration of those markers in systemic inflammation. And the systemic inflammation can be reduced with appropriate periodontal therapy. So the next slide is something that I think is very helpful for you to understand. And that is that Periodontal disease has four stages. 
Okay. And as I said, we had stage one. That's just gingivitis. That's red swollen gums. Okay. We may not even have bleeding upon probing, but just red swollen gums is the first stage of periodontal disease. And as we go to stage two, three, and four, we start to see bone loss. Okay. We're going to see up to 25% bone loss at stage two, up to 50% at stage three, and over 50% at stage four. But what's most important to remember on this slide is that there's kind of a line in the sand here and that stage one is reversible, okay? We can reverse stage one back to stage zero with a good cleaning and good quality home care from our patient or from our pet owners. We can take stage one back, but once we get to stage two, it's no longer reversible. Now, we don't have to let stage two become stage three. We don't have to let stage three move on to stage four. We can halt it at any point, but we can't get that bone loss back. So it's so important that we really start seeing these patients and start getting those dental procedures done at or before even stage one so that we don't have to get to stage three and four. I know so many practices I go into as a consultant don't even really talk to the pet owners about dentistry till they're at a stage three or four. And that's sad because that's when we're losing a lot of teeth and we have this already this infection in their system. So the goals of treatment is that periodontal disease is preventable. Um, we can maintain oral health and these animals can have a healthy mouth their, their entire life. Um, if we're removing that biofilm on a regular basis daily, we can prevent that calculus from forming. And as I said earlier, plaque forms within 20 minutes, calculus within about 48 to 72 hours, which is just calcified plaque. But the more calculus you have, the more plaque you're going to have, and it becomes this kind of vicious cycle. So the goal of, of periodontal disease is to remove those things, to get those out of there. So we're not having um, those areas of those risks of infection. And we also want to minimize our pocket depth. Now, one of the risks we see, or one of the things we see a lot, and I'm not going to get onto this very much, but is anesthesia-free dentistry. And this is something that's probably bigger on both ends of the, the country, east and west coast. Um, but it is something that clients are afraid of the anesthesia. So they, they want to go do anesthesia-free dentistry. But I've watched it done. And it is hard to watch because I could see that patient be so stressed out. You can't really get to the back teeth, back in the mouth. You can't really do a good job um, on the lingual or palatal aspects. Probably it can be done maybe on like 1% of dogs that have stage one periodontal disease. But if you're not cleaning below the gum line, it really, um, it isn't gonna make any difference. Um, one of my uh, colleagues who was actually involved in the uh, 2019 dental guide guidelines here with AHA actually said debris left is disease left. And I'm like, gosh, that resonates so much with me because if I'm not cleaning below the gum line, it might as well not even clean the teeth. There was a, a presentation done at the dental forum a number of years ago where a vet dentist got up and basically gave two situations um, of dogs that were presented to him. One had had his teeth cleaned um, every six months at a veterinary hospital and one had anesthesia-free dentistry. And both of these dogs ended up losing all their teeth because of the horrific disease they had. And even though the one had had his teeth cleaned every six months at a veterinary hospital, they weren't taking x-rays and they were cleaning below the gum line. So of course we had destruction down there. So one of the things that we look at, a lot of people will, you know, back in the day when I started doing dentistry, every patient got three days of antibiotics prior to a dental procedure. And we rarely, um, if ever, use antibiotics much in veterinary dentistry anymore. It's because we found out that bacteremia that we were trying to prevent when we did a dental cleaning, we found out it was very short-lived, maybe about 20 minutes. Now, if we had a patient who had um, some type of an immune issue going on, um, maybe they had that, well, I like to joke calling, you know, grade 17 out of stage stage 17 out of uh, four periodontal disease, that horrible mouth, you know, maybe we put them on an antibiotic a little bit beforehand, um, or if they had heart disease or some other comorbidity, we might want to put them on some type of broad spectrum antibiotic. Very rarely, if we do a good job of cleaning the teeth, do we need to put them on an antibiotic post-procedure. 
So just kind of keep that in mind. We tend to overuse antibiotics in, in, um, the, in the country right now. So, you know, it's something we really have to think hard about before we do it. Now, when it comes to doing senior dentistries and senior patients, we need to kind of have the three Bs. And that means bravery, buddies, and blocks. So bravery is we have to make sure we don't let that animal suffer because we're afraid to perform that dental procedure. Um, if you in your practice are not comfortable doing that procedure on a senior pet, don't hesitate to refer them to a vet dentist. The vet dentists are used to dealing with patients who have comorbidities or have more advanced cases because you know they're used to that anesthesia level and they probably have work with an anesthesiologist on staff who can help keep that patient comfortable and keep that patient safe. Also make sure you always have a dedicated anesthetist present. That's from stage one to stage 17 periodontal disease. Make sure you have someone who is constantly monitoring that patient because whoever is doing the cleaning is not able to monitor at the same time. Okay, I, I remember the days when dentistry was done at the back of the clinic because nobody wanted to hear the machine make a noise because they didn't like the sound. So you were put back there to, to clean the teeth by yourself. And unfortunately, you really didn't notice what was going on until the tongue turned blue. And even with monitors and things, we have to make sure we're constantly laying our hands on that patient, listening to their heart rate, making sure they're okay. And then of course, dental blocks. Um, if you're not using... Uh, regional dental blocks, please take a lab and learn how to do them. They're easy to place. They're super effective. And what happens is we can keep that patient pain-free at a lower dose of inhalant anesthesia. The first time I did blocks, um, we maintained that patient at less than 1% ISO for canine extractions. And I became a hallelujah born again. I'm doing nerve blocks on everybody because I realized how important it was to keep that anesthetic load low. Now to looking again at AHA guidelines, um, I recommend going to you know, the 2020 anesthesia monitoring guidelines and read through them because they have some really great information about how important um, the, the anesthesia and monitoring is. Now we know when we have our senior patients, we have, you know, obviously we have the older patients, they may have a comorbidity. They might have a heart issue. Um, they may have, you know, renal issues. They may have something else happening with them at the same time. So we need to, you know, occasionally stabilize a patient before we put them under anesthesia. Now, I used to have the conversation with my vets that, you know, we would do blood work surgical safety blood work before, an or before a dentistry. And if they had any kind of abnormality in their um, renal values, oh, we can't go to dentistry. And I'm like, but if I get rid of that infection, we could improve their renal numbers. So we have to kind of have this, you know, weigh the options, what's happening here, which is the best option. We need to make sure that, you know, we can actually improve some of the comorbidities when we do a dental cleaning such as diabetes. We know there's a huge link between diabetes mellitus in humans and periodontal disease, as there is in dogs, okay, and cats. So we, we wanna make sure we're you know, treating this so we don't continue to have that, those, those corticosteroids that are presented from periodontal disease that can add to the diabetes mellitus and the, the constant influx of bacteria into the renal system that can lead to renal issues. We just sometimes don't put enough emphasis on the patient's safety when we're looking at dentistry. Also think about you know, using multimodal or, or polypharmacy when it comes to dealing with these senior patients. Um, make sure you have a complete list of all the medications and supplement that patient is on beforehand. You wanna make sure that they may need to discontinue use of some medication prior to the procedure, say they're on an anti-inflammatory or something. Um, you want to make sure they're taken off of that beforehand. You want to make sure you're working with the pet owner, your doctor and your technician working together to determine which meds can be given, you know, the morning of the procedure. Some of these are really important. For instance, diabetes or, you know, insulin. Probably need to make sure we're given that before we do the patient or before we do a, a procedure on that patient. And we also need to be aware of all the drug uh, interactions that can happen. 
So, you know, sometimes when we're working with a patient who's diabetic, we may need to do blood glucose readings during the anesthetic procedure just to make sure they're doing okay. We wanna minimize the risks as much as possible. And that means we're going to do, as I call it, surgical safety blood work, pre-anesthetic blood work. Usually that's going to you know, entail a CBC and a chem panel. Um, in senior patients, we might wanna throw a thyroid panel in there also. Never underestimate the value of a urinalysis, okay? We can go ahead and determine it, not only just with the blood work, but we can get a lot of information from a urinalysis, especially relating to kidney function. Maybe a senior pet should have an ECG done prior to the procedure, as well as chest x-rays. Um, make sure we're doing a full physical examination. And we have to stop the days of everybody got cat bell, okay? We have to customize our anesthetic protocols to match what that patient is dealing with. So if we have that senior patient, maybe we need to think about a different type of induction agent that we can go ahead and use. And of course, block so we can keep that patient at a lower level of anesthetic, inhalant anesthetic. And again, I cannot say it enough, a dedicated anesthetist, somebody who can really sit and monitor that patient throughout the entire procedure. Yeah, we have wonderful monitors available now. They're wonderful, they're great. They're telling us you know, 50 different things, but they're usually behind what's actually happening in that patient. So make sure we have somebody who's literally laying hands on every few minutes to make sure everything is working well. We also need to use balanced anesthesia. And this means we're going to use multiple different drugs because when we do this, we're hitting different areas of the pain pathway, but we're also minimizing the drug effects, but maximizing the benefits of the drugs. So we wanna make sure we don't have to give so much of one drug because if we do a couple different things, we can minimize um, any effects we have from those. And again, it has to be tailored to the specific uh, animal. And I am not an anesthesia uh, guru. I'm just giving you this information. I recommend if you're worried about this, talk to a uh, boarded anesthesiologist or BTS in dentistry to get more information about how to really tailor these um, for these senior patients. Making sure you're using a pre-medication and, and a sedation drug on the patient really is important. We wanna reduce that patient anxiety. It's scary to be there. They're not sure what's happening. Let's kind of take that edge off a little bit because we also know that we're gonna be doing painful procedures. Dentistry hurts, guys. There's no two ways about it. You're always gonna assume it's gonna be painful. Even just a cleaning can be painful. I know when I get my teeth cleaned, I usually just take an ibuprofen as soon as I leave just because I'm, my gums are gonna be a little sore. Um, so make sure you realize that it can hurt. We wanna make sure we're giving a preemptive analgesia beforehand um, so that it's on board by the time we actually start the procedure. And we can look at, you know, there's a bunch of different things you can do, um, whether it's um, midazolam or, or diazepam, acepromazine, dexamethetomidine, something like that that's an analgesic, but also a little bit of a sedative, all right? There's other things that are better. Opioids we're gonna talk about on, on the next slide. These previous ones might be better if they're used with an opioid. So we can look at what type of opioid you want to use. This is going to be the veterinarian's choice, all right? And we really need to look at what receptors we're hitting so that it provides that analgesia. We also need to know that there's side effects with opioids, and we need to make sure we're constantly monitoring. Now, there's some opioids out there that have been used forever in vet med, and I still hear practices using them quite frequently, but we have to realize that they're kind of poor choices for dental pain because, again, it's painful. Uh, butorphanol is not a very strong drug, okay? Um, and it can actually block the effects of other opioids. So, you know, if it took one thing out of the dental mix for me it would be not to use Torb anymore because it's just not strong enough. Now, buprenorphine has been out there forever. Um, again, it can block other opioids effects. Um, it's not as strong as we once thought it was gonna be. Now, one thing you can do is, is add it to your regional nerve blocks and it can actually prolong the effect of a nerve block but it's a very, very minute amount that you add. It's like 0 0.0003 megs per keg. So we're just talking a, a hub can be added to the block and increase the, the longevity of a block. Placing nerve blocks, um, it's super important. They're easy to place. I know it's scary. You're going into 
you know, areas where there might be an eye. Um, there's other things. There's some very inex, uh, safe ways to place blocks. There are other blocks that are um, ways that are being placed, but that could cause a little bit more problems. So do your research, go to a lab, understand how to safely place the blocks. They're super effective and very inexpensive. Um, and again, I can reduce that inhalant, you know, down to 0.1%. So, you know, if you have any questions on nerve blocks, how to place them, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to help you learn how to safely place regional blocks. And then it's important to keep our patient hydrated. A lot of times these stage three, stage four dental procedures can be rather lengthy. lengthy. Um, I never scheduled less than three hours for a stage four because I knew we were gonna have a longer time cleaning. We were gonna have a harder time with extractions. We were gonna have all these issues that could come up. So it was scheduled for three hours. And that's a long procedure for a patient. So we're gonna make sure that we have them an IV in place. Um, we want to make sure we're putting warm fluids into them, not, you know, have the, a warmer on it and then have four feet of line before it gets to the patient. We want that fluid warmer to be right on right before it enters into the patient's body. Sometimes we need to preload them with fluids if necessary, but it's important that we do monitor the kidney output during this time and watch for signs of overhydration when we are adding any type of IV fluids. Another thing that's really super important to monitor is your body temperature of the patient. These smaller animals or even dogs and cats, even larger ones, lose heat readily. They lose heat through their mouth. And that's how dogs cool themselves off. They pant, right? So they, right? That's how they lose their heat when they're overheated. So when we're running copious amounts of cold water into their mouth, we're decreasing their body temperature significantly during a dental procedure. So we have to keep our patient warm and we have to keep them dry. Now I have hot dog on here. I don't care if you're using bear hugger. Um, I like the hot dog because then I don't get hot. It keeps the patient warm without me getting overheated. Um, but whatever you do, I, I just don't like to ever see a patient just laying on a metal grate and not having any warmth on them. It could be getting the little um, bubble wrap baggies that your medications come in. Keep those, put them on their feet. Go to the dollar store and buy baby booties, put them on their feet to help keep them warm. Wrap them in warm towels, whatever you need to do to keep that patient warm during, during, the anest or during that uh, dental procedure. Now, the one thing I would change in this picture, this was supplied to me by hot dogs, is I would never have the animal's head on a towel when I'm doing a dental procedure, because that towel gets wet and it wicks moisture back up onto that patient and cools them down. So I would always keep their mouth at least off of a towel so that the water can drain out of their mouth and not go up onto the patient. And again, monitoring, we wanna make sure that we're monitoring our patients for hypotension. We want that blood pressure between 100 to 160 um, for optimal perfusion. We want to make sure they're doing well. We also want to make sure they're having good oxygen saturation. We want that, you know, no less than 95% normal. We also want to watch that we're not getting hypo um, eczemia here. All right. So we want to make sure we're watching that depth and delivering that uh, O2 the way we need to be. We don't want them to get so low that we have hy hypoxemia here. We want to make sure we're monitoring that patient throughout the entire uh, procedure. Also, end title COs are so important. So we want to make sure that we don't get too, um, too high on the end title. Now, again, talking about procedure length, I mentioned it earlier. Sometimes we need to stage procedures. If we're doing a full mouth extraction, um, because the dog warrants it, you know, we might need to stage that because we don't really want to keep our patients down under three hours. If you are a veterinarian or your veterinarians are not, you know, able to do full mouth in that time frame, either we stage it or we recommend possibly referring them to, some, to a vet dentist who can get them done fairly quickly. Um, we want to make sure that we are performing a cohat before we do anything to kind of get that infection under control. So even if you're going to stage them, get that, in, that COHAT done, that comprehensive oral health assessment and treatment done so that you can get that infection down before you go to doing the procedures. Yes, I do clean a lot of the teeth before we extract them. I know we're pulling that tooth out, 
but I want to get rid of that, a lot of that bacteria on there because we're going to have an open wound. So I'm going to clean them at least partially before we do extractions. Sometimes we might need to have other therapies done. So again, just don't hesitate to stage a procedure if necessary. And this is important that you set the, patient, the, the pet owner up for these expectations and that they may need to have an additional procedure done or this patient might need full mouth extractions. It's scary to hear that when you're a pet owner because you know, oh my God, how are they ever gonna eat? Probably better than they have been for a couple months now. Um, but we wanna make sure they understand how important it can be. And then when we have our patient in recovery, we need to make sure we've got pain management on board. Remember the blocks are there, you know, a good place block with, with um, um, Beeper, excuse me, bibivacaine will probably last eight to 12 hours. Okay. If you add a little bit of buprenorphine to that, it can be up to 48 hours. So you kind of have to watch making sure that they're managed in pain, but we also need to make sure they're going home on some type of pain management for, you know, three to four or five days after an extraction, for instance. We also need to make sure during that recovery period that we maintain those fluids until discharge if necessary. And then of course, when they're in recovery, we don't just put them in the back and ignore them. We need to monitor them when they're in recovery too, because we wanna look and make sure they're having urine output, making sure they're not becoming hypotherm hypothermic because that can have an effect on recovery. And we also wanna make sure they're not becoming bradycardic. Now, when it comes to a discharge with these senior patients, we wanna make sure that we are going through, and this is with any dental patient, but we should schedule a discharge appointment. And this can be a tech appointment, it does not necessarily need to be a veterinarian doing these discharges. But we wanna make sure that someone is talking to that pet owner, preferably before they see their pet, and going over with them, looking at the charts, what did we find? Maybe even looking at the radiographs, seeing what we saw when we looked at this patient, and then going over any care instructions for the immediate care, and then scheduling a follow-up appointment so that we can see them back in a week or two weeks to make sure that we're make, you know, that they're healing well and they're doing well on their home care. This is also where we're going to go over medications that were dispensed, how to give them, when to give them, uh, making sure the pet owner really understands how important it is that we keep that pet as pain-free. And we talk to them too at this point that if it's a cat, that they need to look at that cat every day. You know, um, a lot of times, you know, these cats go home and they're, they're might be a little painful and they go hide under the bed and the pet owner is like, well, I haven't seen them in three days. Um, we need to make sure they're looking at them every day and making sure that pet is doing well and not going into some kind of renal issue because they're not eating or drinking after a dental procedure. So what are some of the common pathologies we see in our senior pets? Well, the first one's pretty obvious. We see a lot of bone loss, okay? Um, we have patients here who have severe bone loss um, on looking at these x-rays, um, just, you know, super super bad bone loss on her. I know that's really kind of a weird way to say it, but we just see a lot of it. Another thing we can see, and we can see some of these things in younger patients too, but a lot of them are gonna be associated with older patients is we can have gingival stomatitis. These is, it's a very chronic situation. It's very painful. Um, we have to rule out some things, um, feline leukemia, um, infectious, um, FIV with these patients, possibly even a relationship to Khaleesi virus. Really the only way to treat gingiva stomatitis effectively is full mouth extractions. Um, we have to remove all the dentin, so you need to make sure you're extracting um, all the teeth and, and follow up with uh, x-rays afterwards. Um, and even that is only about 80% effective. Another thing we see, and now we see this in patients of all ages, especially in, in cats, but it's tooth resorption. And there's five stages of tooth resorption. And that's gonna be based upon the degree of the crown that's involved in the resorption. But there's also three types. And it's very important to understand these types can only be assessed by radiograph and whether or not we can see the periodontal ligament. And the type is going to help the veterinarian determine what's the best treatment. So in situation here, I have a type one, I can see that periodontal ligament on these roots. It's that black line that surrounds the roots. This means this has to be extracted. If I look at a tooth that has tooth resorption and I can't determine that there's any periodontal ligament left because it has 
total, totally ankylosed and there's nothing left of it, then we can do a crown amputation. Now, there's also a type that's type three where it's one root of each, sorry about that, one root of each because, you know, we have to do extraction on one and crown amputation on the other root. Now we are seeing more and more tooth resorption in dogs and we treat it basically the same as we do in cats. However, if it's like the one with the red circle around it, um, we can wait and see on that. Um, it's probably not going to affect, it may never hit the crown in a dog. Um, we know they're not painful until it hits the crown. So just kind of keep that in mind, understand when to treat on, on tooth resorption in dogs and cats. We also get alveolar bone expansion. That's when we get those cats that come in with that bulbous or bulging appearance on the maxillary canines. This is due to chronic infection, okay? Chronic periodontal disease, chronic infection, the bone starts to change and becomes very expansive. Um, we always wanna biopsy them, okay? Make sure it's not some type of cancer, but we wanna make sure we can remove that tooth and remove all of that necrotic bone. Because if we don't remove that necrotic bone, we are just going to continue to have infection in, in that oral cavity. Now, in addition to the, the maxillary, um, or excuse me, the alveolar bone expansion, we do see canine extrusion. And that means basically because that bone is changing, it's pushing that tooth out a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if this is really where the term long in the tooth came from, but I'm gonna throw it in there. But the tooth becomes longer, the maxillary canines become longer and it can actually cause trauma to the lower lips. So when we see this, it is best to really extract that tooth with a surgical flap and remove all that necrotic bone also. We can see discolored teeth. These are, you know, this can happen in younger animals too, but we wanna make sure that we know it's not in extrinsic stain that's just on the crown or on the crown. This is usually due to pulpitis, due to damage to that tooth at some point during, um, you know, playing or something like that, the tooth was damaged. We used to say when we saw discolored teeth, you can just kind of watch and see, see what happens. The recommendation now is either to extract them or perform a root canal on them, um, sending them to a specialist because we don't know if they're painful. We also see a lot of fractures in older patients. Um, and this can be, this is one of the type of fractures we see. It's an, an enamel infraction. Um, and you really aren't going to have any problems with this. It's just noted that there are um, kind of these little cracks and you won't even feel them. If I ran an explorer over this tooth, I'm not going to really feel those, but it's just to know that there's kind of these cracks underneath the enamel. Now we have uncomplicated crown fractures and uncomplicated crown root fractures. These are going to be where we start to see um, we have a fracture, but we don't have any pulp exposure, okay? So just kind of keep in mind that we have two different kinds of fractures. If you do not see a pulp, the pulp is not exposed. It's called uncomplicated fracture. And then, of course, we have when the pulp is exposed, we have a complicated crown fractures. Some of these can be saved with the root canal. Um, others, like the picture on the bottom right, is probably nothing's going to save that tooth. It just needs to be removed. We also get root fracture. Sometimes we see a mobile tooth. We think, oh, it's a mobile incisor. We take an x-ray, it's actually a fracture at the root. So we wanna make sure that we are looking at these x-rays to see what's happening. Another thing we can see in older patients, especially dogs, and this is extremely rare, but we can start to see caries or cavities. And it's only going to be on our back molars where we have more of an occlusal chewing surface. Um, it's actually decay. Yes, they could be saved with some type of restoration, cleaning them up, putting a restoration in, uh, depending on how advanced they are, but they are painful. Um, and you know, a lot of times, and this is kind of anecdotal, but I've heard a lot of times we see these very commonly in dogs who eat a lot of carrots. It's a sweet thing, okay? We don't see caries in dogs as much as we do in humans. So just kind of keep that in mind. Another thing we'll see is abrasion. This is from an animal who constantly is chewing on some kind of foreign object. Um, tennis balls are prime candidates. This is a, a mouth that, that, you know, has been affected by constantly carrying a tennis ball around. A tennis ball is rough. It's a little bit like, um, oh, what do I want to say the word is, like a uh, sandpaper, <laughs> okay? It's constantly wearing that tooth down. And you add a little saliva and, and dirt to it, it adds even more to remove that, um, that, that enamel. Uh, it's okay to play with tennis balls, but take them away. Don't let the dog chew on them all the time. Cage chewers, you'll see this, and you'll also see this in animals who constantly have dermatolo dermatological issues who are constantly chewing on themselves. 
you'll see it on their incisors. Another thing we see in older patients sometimes is attrition, and that's bone on bone or tooth on tooth wear. And that's where, you know, in this situation, that maxillary third incisor is going to cut a groove into that bottom molar or bottom canine because it's constantly being hit every time that patient bites down. Another thing we see is oral masses, gingival masses. Um, we always want to look at the entire oral cavity when we're doing an oral exam, not just the teeth. We want to look at the oral pharynx. We want to look at the palate, inside the cheeks, underneath the tongue, all of those places. At any time you see an oral mass, biopsy it. I usually kind of joke that in, in veterinary dentistry, if it doesn't look too bad, it's probably really bad. If it looks eh, horrible, it's probably nothing. This, however, in this picture is nasty. It looks nasty. This is a melanoma um, in a dog that, you know, um, presented to, uh, to us in practice. So always, always biopsy. You can never just say something is cancer if you don't know, and you can't say it's not if you don't have a biopsy. Even a simple epulis or a little, you know, overgrowth of tissue, um, what we used to call just an epulite, can be an acanthomosis ameliablastoma. So always, always biopsy these things. Sometimes it's just gingival enlargement. We'll see that hyperplastic gingiva we see in, in boxers and things. But every type, of bio, every type of mass we see, we should biopsy. We have oral tumors here, squamous cell carcinomas. Um, these are probably the most commonly diagnosed oral tumor in cats, um, usually older cats, 11 to 13 years of age. Um, you have to biopsy them. They're usually going to be uh, sometimes underneath the tongue, um, they can be anywhere in the mouth, but this is the most common type of, of uh, tumor we see in cats, followed by fibrosarcomas. And these are, while they're the second most common, they're rarely rare. All right, we don't see them that often. Again, it's older animals that we'll see these in, and you're going to see them on the rostral gingiva. We can also get what we call contact mucocytosis ulceration, used to be called CUPS, chronic ulcerative periodontal stomatitis, um, where we have a, the tissue of the mucosa is constantly in contact with the infected area of the tooth. So we constantly get that contact you know, um, ulceration going on. We also get that bone infection, that osteomyelitis that can happen in these older patients. We could see fistulas or draining tracts due to a fracture. Um, cats usually don't get a, a um, um, fistula like this dog has. They usually will get a draining tract like this. Um, sometimes it's weird because you might think that draining tract is associated with the canine, but in this case, it was actually the third premolar that was abscessed and that's where it decided to, to uh, kind of blow out, shall we say. We also see oral nasal fistulas where we have direct communication from the oral cavity to the sinuses because of extreme bone loss, all right? We have to make sure we're looking for them. So when we're probing, we're doing 365 degrees around the tooth. Um, this is the most common breed for this is gonna be dachshunds, but we see it in almost any breed of dog. I have seen this in cats as well. Um, it has to be surgically repaired so that we don't constantly have that food impacting into the animal's sinuses. And then it's important that we do these annual cohats. And I like the term cohat, comprehensive oral health assessment and treatment. We need to make sure we start early with them, probably you know, at least at the age of two. We want to prevent that infection before we get to where we have severe infection. Let's not wait till the patient's at stage three or four. Let's prevent it at stage one. Because remember, stage one is reversible. So if we can prevent it, we can prevent severe infection, we can prevent tooth loss and even systemic issues, and we have healthier patients. This old girl was one of my dogs. She, um, was, she lived to be only 11, um, but she had polyimmune-mediated arthritis. And I know this is going to sound weird to some of you, but gosh, when I had to finally put her down, I kind of took a look at her teeth, and her teeth were perfect at 11 years of age. No recession, no bone loss, no nothing, um, because we did regular care on her to keep her mouth as healthy as possible. Just because they're old doesn't mean they have to lose their teeth. So we want to talk a little bit about 
the, the ACC Dental Loop. It's kind of a new product that's been out. Um, and what it uses, it's using targeted pulse electromagnetic field therapy that centers around the use of uh, electromagnetic waves that are targeted at specific areas. And this is going to help that patient naturally recover. So when we use this loop, it's going to make sure it's a safer way of helping to recover. It's FDF FDA cleared, it's a drug-free alternative for treating pain and anxiety and even behavior issues. But when we look at the dental loop, it has some really great possibilities because it's going to locally reduce oral and dental pain and inflammation that happens with that. It's going to reduce the pain and swelling. So if we have a dental procedure or some type of oral facial surgery done or trauma, it can really help with that. It can also reduce the needs for opioids and other pain medication. Probably not gonna replace them, but it can reduce the amount we need to use. And it's going to aid in the preparation of oral tissues for surgery. So I really um, recommend you guys looking into having these loops. I think they're good for about 60 uses, um, 60 treatments. So um, it's something to really have and, and have in your practice. And all the patient has, all the client has to do is kind of hold this over the muzzle um, of the patient, you know, several times a day, just to kind of help that tissue heal up a little bit. I just want to go on. And if you're interested in becoming a VTS in dentistry, go to the ABDT website, ABDT US, or you can join the foundation for veterinary dentistry and, and get a journal every quarter. Just a little self-promotion. If you're interested in my textbook, the link is here, but the link is also on my website, which is btcveted.com or follow me on Facebook. I have a ton of different little videos on there. So I wanna thank you for your attention today. And um, just to let you know, this is my senior kitty. Uh, this was taken about five years ago. He is now 17 and is still doing great. Um, but um, cats and dogs can live longer, healthier lives if we keep their mouth healthy. So do we have any questions? We do, Mary, I do see one. Uh, here it is, let's see. What do you think about, and my eyes are bad, doxorobe being used when only one side of a root has moderate bone loss? I would still use it, Heather. Um, I think it's a, a great thing to do. You wanna clean that periodontal pocket out. Um, I mean, I used it in uh, periodontal pockets over five millimeters in depth, all right? Um, you want to make sure that pocket is as clean as possible with using the proper alter, um, ultrasonic tip to help flush it out, break up the debris, bust the cell walls of the bacteria, but make sure you're using the periodontal tip. Um, and then go ahead and place that doxyrobe in there. It's going to make a big difference, even if it's on just one side. And she says, thank you very much. Uh, next question, are there specific CE or lab teachers or organizations that you recommend for learning blocks? Well, Carrie Ann, I'm one of those people. I actually do in-clinic trainings on lab um, placing blocks, but I can also do webinars for your team if you're interested. Um, almost every major conference has a dental lab at some point, um, and, and blocks are going to probably be part of that. If you're attending Western Vet Conference this March, I'm doing a lab there that will also include blocks there. But, um, there's a lot of different things out there on placing blocks. So she says, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, next question. Have you worked in any practice that used ozonated irrigation during dental prophylaxis? Uh, Susan, I, you, you stumped me here. No, I have not used that. Not exactly sure what that means for sure. Um, but I, I think it is something fairly new. I think I, I, I have read about it now that I, my brain is working here. No, but I have not worked with it. So I don't know enough to really comment on that. Okay, uh, next question. What protocol would you or do you recommend for home care for clients? What protocol for home care? Well, um, and I'm assuming you're talking about long-term home care, not you know immediate post-procedure. Um, I, um, I would say that, you know, toothbrushing is awesome. That's the gold standard. But quite frankly, only about one to 2% of people are going to actually do that. So I really like uh, oral wipes. 
um, as a way of, of wiping. There's one called um, oral cleansing wipes. People will wipe the teeth before they brush it. That's one option. Um, feeding a good quality dental chew that's gonna actually reduce plaque and things like that off the teeth are another option. Um, feeding a dental diet, because people have to feed their dogs. You know, so a dental diet is a good way of keeping the teeth as clean as possible. So you kind of have to find out what your patient will allow, what the client is willing to do. I'm not a big believer in water additives. I don't think they really do a whole lot um, for them, um, but it's something, a tool in the toolbox. But, you know, it, it, you really have to kind of customize your home care protocols to what your client will do. So I guess that's not probably the answer you want, um, but um, that's kind of the way we really have to look at it. And I usually give my clients a couple options. So maybe if they're going to say they're going to brush, they're going to brush every day, um, that we also add a chew to that so that the days they can't brush, the animal can still get a dental cleaning. Because we want to remove that plaque every day before it starts to calcify.